is a professor of the uh, University of Paderborn in Germany, and actually since uh, 2010, uh, he works at uh, University, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, in Ah, okay. 1994 to 1997, and other universities in Brazil. He do his PhD at the University of Berlin and the Master uh, in Science in University of Munich. Uh, is uh, uh, he has a, a great experience in photovoltaic uh, projects and installations, and he will. Uh, appreciate the, the class. Okay, uh, I will pass the word to Professor Stefan Crota to start the class. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, I just had my curriculum gives away. <laughs> just, uh, I see all here. Uh, so uh, this is about uh, uh, what I'm doing. Uh, uh, this is our uh, chair here at the University of Paderborn. Uh, it's called Sustainable Generation in Use of Energy. It's both related, it comes later in the talk, you will hear also about more uh, use of energy because it has to be coordinated with the generation, otherwise it gets very expensive. Uh, we work there also on uh, energy efficient buildings, uh, wind power, uh, especially wind power monitoring, decentralized energy systems. Uh, it's a big issue in now in Germany because we have a very inflexible large scale uh, uh, energy structure which is not, uh, sometimes not able to cope with the uh, fast fluctuations of wind and solar power. Uh, virtual energy storage, so it has to avoid expensive storage and negative virtual load shifting uh, via remote uh, control of loads, yield prediction and optimization of PD. So that's what we are doing. If you're interested, I have also some brochures with me. You can uh, take one or just take a look at the homepage, which is uh, here. Uh, you can see here this our, uh, our, our page here. Um, Mr. Achilles, uh, Professor Achilles also told here about my curriculum a little bit. So uh, I've been here in Brazil almost 10 years. Uh, first eight years in Copa uh, uh, or in Rio de Janeiro, uh, and in Tuisa for the laser. Fortunately, not in Sao Paulo. <laughs> I've been there for some events also. I know Professor Achilles very well. So he visited his first lab in 1994, which is when he just came back from the so uh, what we are hearing today, it's very uh, large, so we have got three lectures, each of them with 100 minutes. So I prepared uh, 400 slides, so be prepared. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, some of them I will um, jump large quickly over it because I saw, for example, uh, for uh, energy storage and fuel cells, we don't have to explain, you already get a special lecture on that. Uh, but it plays a larger, larger role, not only generation is important, but also the uh, uh, what we do with energy, how we get, get to the customer. Sometimes we have to store it, uh, which is not very favorable because uh, it's now uh, more expensive than the generation, as you will see later. Uh, but first, we start on the potential of solar energy, irradiance, and so on. Uh, then uh, we go uh, historically uh, to, to solar thermal systems, concentration of uh, uh, solar irradiance. Uh, then I come to uh, the photovoltaic uh, energy conversion and the manufacturing of uh, cells, modules, uh, the characteristics and performance. Uh, then we come to the system size, uh, how we interconnect solar modules to each other, uh, what we need to connect them to the grids, uh, explain a bit about inverters, uh, and um, then the mounting of the OS uh, on uh, off-grid systems. This uh, plays a really large role uh, in the last years because uh, the solar cells always got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper in the so-called balance of systems costs. They, did, they also decreased in price, but not so much. So, but these are now, now the most uh, expensive part in the value chain. So I will show you later on that. Uh, come to this, uh, talking about uh, money, uh, talk about market development. Uh, uh, what are the markets? Uh, what are the prices uh, and the costs? Um, and uh, then uh, how we can optimize it, uh, talking about performance, how we can optimize the performance, uh, getting more energy out of it, uh, uh, and uh, give some examples of optical, thermal, electrical um, uh, optimization. 
Also, uh, if we think about the other way, we can extend the lifetime of modules, so we talk about durability of PD modules and systems, and what we can do in this direction. And uh, while, uh, for example, if we need light, uh, we cannot have solar light in the night time, so we have to store the energy, so I give a little bit uh, insights about uh, energy storage, and uh, some recommendations about uh, setup uh, and common mistakes of setting up large-scale PV power plants. And the very end, I talk about research, new technology, and actual trends in that world. Let's start. So, um, first a question. Um, uh, what do you guess uh, is the actual um, contribution of uh, solar energy to our living presently? So if, uh, if the world uh, economy or the world population and uh, some of use, some use solar energy, some not, and uh, what will be, what's the actual uh, contribution? What do you guess? For example, is it 1% or 5%? Who is for 5%? Yes, one. 20%? No, if you take the actual uh, uh, planet system, it's actually 94%. This sounds really a lot. Many people are not aware of that. Uh, that's because uh, uh, without the sun, if we would switch off the sun, we would have solar energy, uh, the uh, whole planet would be freezing cold. Uh, and. Uh, in order to reach the presently global medium temperatures about 13 degrees, in order to reach that, uh, we have solar energy. And if we would do it by fossil fuels, for example, uh, we would uh, need a, a lot of a lot of a lot of energy. The moment we just have to um, Brazil is not necessary. Sometimes in Sao Paulo for heating to come from 13 degrees to a little bit above in Germany, uh, the highest energy consumption is actually heating. We don't need a uh, lot for cooling and for for electrical. Uh, it's also not so much the, the, the biggest uh, sector is really heating. Um, and uh, I said 30 degrees, yeah, due to climate change, so already 14.5 degrees, so it just increased already one degree since I uh, talked first about that. Um, so uh, this, uh, if we wouldn't have the sun, uh, we would need about 50 times the world's energy consumption we have today, which is already a lot, which is 429.4 uh, exajoules. Remember exajoule? How much is it? <coughs> 10 to a power of? 18, exactly. 18. 10 to the power of 18, a lot of food, and we'll need 15 times of that. So uh, it's really a lot, and uh, we just have to uh, do it one time uh, to substitute in the existing uh, rest energy consumption by solar energy. Um, I talked about fossil energies. Uh, if you think about fossil uh, energies like coal and gas and uh, oil, uh, where does it come from? Actually, it's a long-term converted solar energy because it took the planet about 150 million years uh, uh, to convert uh, all by photosynthesis uh, to create all this uh, uh, biomass and the uh, um, animals and so on, which later have been turned within billions of years into um, into fossil fuels. And we burned at a very fast rate. So we burned uh, more than half uh, uh, within 200 years, and it takes uh, 150 million years to recreate. So that's another good uh, sustainable way of uh, energy use. Uh, best would, would be if we um, don't wait 150 million years if we use uh, the uh, solar energy directly. I'll give you some examples. Um, I know just why you use solar energy is also. I think you're well aware of that greenhouse effect uh, uh, that uh, due to the uh, fast emission of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, we have this greenhouse effect. Uh, the, uh, here the uh, um, infrared radiation can escape through the atmosphere and heats up. And this is a prediction how much the, uh, uh, how much the uh, temperature will increase. Presently we have already one degree. And uh, all agree that uh, if we have more than two degrees, uh, there will be uh, quite uh, serious uh, damage uh, on the planet. So here we see the two degrees limit. Uh, what we already observe uh, here, for example, in the United States, that the crop yields fall due um, to short, short of wattage. Uh, also, very uh, obvious is the, that all the glaciers are melting, no matter whether it's on the Alps or whether north or south pole. Uh, we see directly. 
And also we observe uh, here in Northern Africa and sometimes also south down in Brazil, we have water shortages. So this is also related uh, to the long-term climate change. And at the end, if all the ice melted, we will have rising seas, which will happen not now, but later, if it's uh, melting. And then also, there can be abrupt climate change, because as you know, if you have a drink, you have a caipirinha with ice, and the, if the ice is melted, the temperature rises very fast, because uh, the, um, the ice serves as a kind of cold storage. So as long as ice is present, uh, when the temperature is uh, kept very cold, uh, uh, it's like phase change material, but as soon as a lot of the ice melted, then the temperature will rise at a much quicker rate. Uh, species of extents we observed in a longer time, also uh, to see how the storms, droughts, fires, and heat waves. And uh, as I tell, don't worry, just it could be abrupt climate change. People be better than two degrees, or maybe at four degrees, when we have the rising sea levels and so on. But it's in general, it's a thing we should avoid. Uh, as I told already, uh, we could convert uh, uh, solar energy directly into um, the energy we need. That's actually this 429 exajoule we need um, for, the, for the planet. Um, and uh, this in comparison to all the fuels we have. So um, we have oil, if you put this perhaps 40 years or 30 years, there's a lot of discussion about this, but we use uh, uh, um, uh, uh, how much does it last? But you see it's limited. Also natural gas even more limited. Uh, coal lasts a bit longer, so people think about maybe 200 years if this doesn't increase. So now, now we have uh, increasing energy consumption worldwide. Uh, some people think also uh, nuclear power would be a solution, but we have many problems with that. There's nuclear waste, proliferation, uh, and also the resources are not so big, so there's not a solution uh, uh, for always. So, um, and uh, what we can do against it, just uh, take a look at the sun. That's the solar energy which comes in with one year only. So this is only not uh, like these resources, which took 150 million years to create. This is one year only. So much more than all resources we have for all time. And uh, about 15,000 times um, the energy we need if we convert it by 100%. Even if you convert it by 10% only, uh, it's uh, more than 1,500 times the energy we need. So if we would uh, use a very conservative estimate, a very uh, bad efficiency, 10% uh, conversion efficiency of photovoltaics, so laboratory cells now make 30%, you can buy easily in store 20%, but it's calculated with 10% of conversion efficiency, also including a space in between the solar modules and so on. Uh, uh, this is Africa, this is, des this is desert here, nobody lives there, this is desert of Sahara. And just to supply the whole world with energy, not only electrical energy, but whole energy for transport, for heating and so on, we would need that square. That's quite big, 300 by 300 kilometers, so not small, but uh, it's feasible. It's not really something uh, out of, out of, completely out of range. Uh, for Europe it would be that. For Brazil, uh, interestingly, Brazil has about the same energy consumption as Germany. Um, Germany only has half of the population, we consume a bit more because, as I told you, we have winter and so on. And, uh, uh, but uh, you need just uh, this spot of, of, uh, of, uh, of covered uh, by solar cells. Um, it's not really a good solution uh, to do it like that because you have to store the energy because you have only uh, during daytime, nighttime, so there were some ideas if you distribute it around the planet. Uh, this is uh, that one, so uh, this is uh, some power plants which are distributed here. Uh, one in the Sahara, one in Saudi Arabia, one in Australia, one here in Mongolia, one in North America and South America. And if you interconnect all those, you have um, a power supply uh, which goes on for 24 hours. And also because it's north and south related, you have also running it uh, through the whole year. So there is no, uh, you avoid seasonal uh, changes uh, by that. So uh, that's not cheap. It's about uh, 20,000 uh, billion euros. Um, so it sounds a, a lot if you compare it. Uh, but if you, if you, for example, take into consideration uh, the so-called war for oil and so on, if you go to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and so on, which was basically, even the Americans admitted that this, uh, this was a war for oil, it costed alone 1,400 billion uh, euros. 
uh, to, to Python. So this is already uh, not really 10%, uh, but almost a, a share of those uh, who would have the whole uh, world. Uh, so there would, wouldn't be any fight anymore for, for resources because uh, there would be uh, enough power for everyone and forever. Uh, these are the cost developments of um, this quite interestingly. This is a graph from, uh, from MIT uh, 10 years ago. So this was about uh, the cost estimation. So they were 2005, they estimated it will be at uh, 20 cents, uh, US cents uh, per kilowatt hour. It's about similar to uh, euro cents. It's about, uh, the euro is about 14% more than the uh, US dollar. Uh, and so in, in our days, we would have in the vicinity below. Sense. Uh, so this was basically true for all the other resources uh, we have, but uh, for photovoltaics to, uh, to a large development in the last decade, uh, this changed a lot. So um, now we, are, we achieved in Germany 6 cents per kilowatt hour, so it's much less than this, and in sunny locations, the last tender, I come to this when I will talk about the market development, was even at 2 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's even cheaper than thermal energy. So if you just burn something, uh, it costs you two cents just for the, the operation of the, the power plant without generation of electricity. That's quite interesting development, but I come to this a bit later. Um, first, we talk about our resource. Uh, it's both valid for solar thermal and photovoltaic application. So we have our sun, which is in a very this is a, a fusion reactor which works reliable since four billion years. Uh, and those work on for four million years. And uh, to the safe distance, about 150 million uh, kilometers away. So that's not really adequate to size. So in truth, uh, the, the Earth would be much smaller and the distance would be much higher. So it's a bit distorted. Um, and um, even uh, the light alone from the sun to the Earth takes about eight minutes to arrive there. So it's just a vast distance. If you go with the speed of light, it takes eight minutes to come there. Even if you consider uh, that uh, they are arriving 178 petawatt, so 10 by our power 15 uh, watts on the planet Earth, 15,000 times the uh, world's energy consumption. And uh, the rest is wasted, there's just space here, and uh, just it's quite astonishing how, how, how big the power is here. Uh, and um, the actual uh, fusion takes place in the middle of the sun, it takes place at very high temperature about 15 million degrees Celsius, or 15 million degrees Kelvin. Uh, uh, what we see, actually, is uh, just the uh, very relatively cold surface of the sun, which is at uh, 5,800 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, this creates that spectrum. Mr. Planck invented this formula about 100 years ago. Uh, this depends on temperature. When you go, for example, if the sun would be irradiated the middle of it would be very harsh uh, um, um, X-ray uh, radiation, and uh, I think a human uh, habitat would be possible on that planet. Uh, but this, while we have a quite cold surface and receive the irradiation at, uh, at a very moderate uh, uh, wavelength, so this is a visible part starting from uh, 400 nanometers. Before that, that's called ultraviolet, and then it goes up to 800 nanometers above, uh, uh, beyond that, it's called uh, infrared. Uh, this visible part, the big share of that, the human habitat developed it because it wants to profit most of the, uh, well, the highest solar radiances available. Uh, we can see the, uh, ultravi uh, the ultraviolet, we can see the infrared, but solar cells can. So therefore, we talk not about sunlight, we talk about solar irradiance or solar radiation when we talk about photovoltaics. People mix it up, is there how much sunlight you need? Yes, uh, the, the solar cells can uh, work with sunlight, but uh, for example, silicon can work up to 1,150 nanometers. So it can uh, uh, work uh, with infrared radiation too. And therefore, we don't call it light. We work, we, we, we're talking now in, the, in this session of the, uh, about uh, the solar irradiance. Uh, so this is the effect of the temperature, as I mentioned already, about uh, 6,000 Kelvin to create that spectrum with a maximum of 500 nanometers or 550 nanometers. Um, uh, if you have uh, old-fashioned light bulbs, um, uh, it would be good if you would have a material which could uh, withstand that, then you would have the same spectrum. 
Um, but there is no material which can withstand that. So the old-fashioned light bulbs, they have uh, the, the best materials is, uh, um, what do you call it, this is um, Wolfram. Wolfram. I don't know the English word, Wolfram. There are some materials and metals which can withstand about 3,000 degrees, but the maximum you can get, otherwise it gets liquefied. And uh, therefore, each light bulb has a spectrum like this. So remember, uh, you have here from 400 to 800 nanometer, that's a visible part. Uh, so the efficiency of a light bulb is very low, because uh, the largest part by a light bulb is infrared emission. So it, it takes, uh, it, it's creating much more infrared radiation, so it's more, uh, more of a radiator, an infrared radiator, I should rather than a, a light source. Um, nowadays it's much better because we have LEDs, so they have almost a factor of 10 better in efficiency, and they can uh, really create uh, the, um, the light in the wavelengths the way you like it. But, uh, um, just to give you an idea how this works, this, is, this was just the explanation of the plant formula. Uh, then we have another, so this was about the spectrum. Um, we talked also about the distance and the irradiance. Uh, additionally, we have another effect. Um, the, the sun, uh, the, 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 the Earth is turning around the sun, um, but the axis, uh, the auto rotation of the Earth and the auto uh, rotation around the sun are not in parallel. There was a big event, uh, possibly uh, this event some uh, almost a billion years ago, uh, the moon was created, there was a crash with a, with a almost uh, Earth-sized planet with that, and uh, the moon was created, and uh, it also tilted that axis from parallel to uh, 23.5 degrees. So we have uh, not an equal rotation, some planets on the, uh, they have that, but the Earth not. So we have here a, a, a tilted rotation, and uh, we have the moon here, not, uh, shown here, uh, and uh, so we have uh, some special um, um, conditions. Uh, so we have uh, here in December, uh, we have that the, the, north, the southern hemisphere, the large part of Brazil, is looking more towards the sun, so we have uh, summer there. If we go here to Europe, uh, Germany, North America, uh, it's looking away from the sun. So here it doesn't receive that much sun, and therefore we have winter there. Vice versa, it's nowadays here, 21st of June, so we have the northern hemisphere uh, looking more towards the sun, and the southern hemisphere is looking away, and so theoretically we have winter, not really cold here, but if we go more south uh, to uh, Buenos Aires or to uh, Porto Alegre and so on, that's quite, uh, it's getting quite cold uh, these days there. Then we have two other dates uh, which are really important. Uh, this is uh, the 21st of, uh, of March. Um, there the sun is exactly perpendicular over the equator. And at that date, all cities in the world, they receive 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of night. This is called equinox. The same occurs here at the 22nd. It's not totally symmetrical because uh, it's 22nd of uh, September. And then uh, we have the uh, same, so the sun is uh, shining perpendicular on the equator, and uh, we have 12 hours daylight and uh, uh, 12 hours nighttime in all parts of the world. Um, here we have a value that's a so called extraterrestrial irradiance, that's an irradiance which a satellite see. So if you have a satellite, they receive 1365 watt per square meter. So this is an exact value because there are no clouds and so on. Also, it's look, they're looking usually perpendicular to the sun, and so you can have that value. Uh, so uh, that's the maximum we can theoretically achieve if, the, if we would have an atmosphere and it would be right directed. So if someone says he has 1,400, uh, it's not possible because this is a, the irradiance which arrives above atmosphere on the uh, on the Earth. So these are some basic outlines uh, here. Uh, if we are just now position, positioning ourselves on the, uh, on the Earth here, somewhere here, and uh, look towards the sun, uh, we make some agreements. Uh, so we say, uh, okay, uh, the sun has a position, uh, some elevation. We call it elevation of the sun, gamma s, so s for sun, and gamma is the elevation angle. And also, it's looking in a certain direction. Uh, north would be zero. 
uh, south would be 180 degrees. Uh, this is called the azimuth, solar azimuth. Uh, this is important, for example, if you have uh, here the so called, uh, you want to check the influence of the atmosphere. So if the sun shines perpendicularly to the atmosphere, there's some filtering by the atmosphere, the shortest way to get to the atmosphere, uh, so the filtering is lowest, and we call that air mass 1, AM1. So I go through here. Uh, for any other position, uh, we have a longer uh, way to the atmosphere. For example, here, this is 1.5 times uh, the way to the atmosphere, so the uh, filtering is also stronger. Uh, there and uh, it reduces the solar radiance, so the quantity of the radiance is reduced, but also it modifies the spectrum of the solar radiance. Uh, come to this uh, next. You want to calculate it here, this AMX is uh, just one divided by the sinoid of the elevation angle. So this is about equivalent uh, to 42 degrees of elevation angle, AM1.5. So you see a difference, so this is uh, the uh, extraterrestrial radiation called AM0 because it appears here above uh, the sanity here would be AM0, uh, so that's the spectrum of that, so it's not perfect black body radiation, uh, but almost, uh, and uh, then we have uh, here AM1.5 radiation. So first see it's, it's uh, less, but you see also that there's some uh, almost complete absorption for some planets. This is different uh, um, components of the atmosphere. Um, most famous is ozone, which, which, which absorbs the ultraviolet part, but also water vapor, or even carbon dioxide. Other, they are responsible for the reduction here. Uh, and they create a different spectrum. To continue that, uh, you can go, if you, for example, if you go uh, close to sunrise or sunset, for here, for example, for an elevation angle of 10 degrees, uh, it would be, if you are at the equator, uh, for equinox, it would be um, 40 minutes before a sunset, uh, then we would have this spectrum. Uh, to color a little bit in the color where it appears, because this is our uh, um, uh, uh, famous uh, color we have on sunrise and sunset, it's red. So you have, uh, uh, here uh, we have almost no uh, radiation in the, in the ultraviolet region, most of them occurs only after in the vicinity here in the 800 nanometers and disappears red. So human eyes say, okay, we have nice sunrise and sunset. Um, and uh, this is due to this effect uh, by this air mass because it doesn't absorb equally, it absorbs the blue part a bit stronger than the, uh, the red part. And here for the intermediate, uh, you see this. Why I'm telling you this? This is also because uh, the uh, solar modules uh, or solar cells are selective. They do not convert at the same rate all the kind of irradiance. Depending on the cell technologies, for example, silicon has its maximum efficiency in the 800 nanometer region, crystalline silicon is here, most effective, while other, for example, amorphous silicon is more sensible in the uh, blue part. Uh, or other technologies. Therefore, we have to talk a little bit about that. So, but I will tell you that. Also, we have the so called standard test conditions. That means we have a fixed spectrum. It's called uh, AM1.5, uh, which we use for comparing uh, solar cells. Otherwise, it could be cheating very easily. You take the maximum efficiency of your cell, for example, you take a silicon solar cell, you put in a laser with 800 nanometers, and then uh, you would have almost 100% of efficiency if you give the illumination without any UV content uh, and so on, and uh, then you would have just a, a very good quantum efficiency of that. And uh, Therefore, there was agreement that it's one AM 1.5 where you test the solar module, ter terrestrial solar modules. Uh, formerly, if you, most of the photovoltaic development occurred in space um, two decades ago, and so there was AM0 was the standard spectrum. But now it's uh, for terrestrial application, it's AM 1.5. But I come to this a bit later. This, for example, for Berlin, so you see the different positions of the sun. Uh, in Sao Paulo, it doesn't uh, differ so much, but in Berlin, in winter, for example, the uh, sun is only 40 degrees above horizon. So just this very red light during the winter time, and uh, only for a very sh short period of time. This is the according air mass here. So in Berlin, we never get AM1, uh, just 
best we can get is nowadays, the 21st of June, uh, AM 1.15 and the elevation angle of 60.8 degrees. And AM 1.5, so you don't have to buy an expensive solar simulator, you can wait for the date and then you can uh, also put your uh, solar panels there and test it almost with standard test conditions. Uh, this will be possible here in Berlin for uh, midday on the 1st of April or the 12th of uh, September. There we have exactly 1.5. Also for, 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 it's also possible for Sao Paulo. Fortunately, you don't have a slide for that. Uh, this is just the uh, uh, solar uh, atzimut angle uh, for uh, different kinds of here, uh, so here uh, we are now in this direction, uh, we are now in this state, so already sun goes up at 4 o'clock in the morning in these states in, in Berlin. So you, uh, and only goes down at 20, we, we even have daylight saving time, it goes down at 9 o'clock. So we have very, if you are going holidays in Europe, it's, now is the best time to go, because you have a long sunshine period, so uh, almost 15 hours of sunshine during uh, the day. Don't go there in December, December because People uh, they have holidays in Brazil in winter and they are totally disappointed and say, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's even for Germans, it's disgusting. It starts at 8 o'clock and already at 4 o'clock it's night already. And the sun only goes up and uh, it is, this is even for, for clear sky. Most of them is not clear sky, it's even worse than that. So, it's, uh, so this is a quite a high fluctuation. The difference uh, in Europe between summer and winter is quite, uh, quite big. Um, if you go to other locations, for example, we go more south now, uh, we go to, uh, to the African continent here, Cairo. Uh, so here the variation is, is much less here, that's just lowest position at 36 degrees, highest position uh, is not AM1, it's not 90 degrees, uh, but close to that, and then uh, this looks already different. So here the uh, sun goes up very quickly, and uh, also it stays more around going up in east and going down in west. Uh, if you go back to, to Berlin, you see almost goes up here nowadays in north, east, and goes down in northwest. Uh, so almost makes a circle. If you go more north, even, you can have a complete circle. If you go above uh, the polar circle, 70 degrees, you have a complete circle. And sun never sets in uh, for a period of time. While in winter, it, uh, it doesn't rise at all. So it's <laughs> a little bit. So uh, here it's for Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so Bit different. Uh, it's about the same graph, but polar coordinates here you see here if you west and east, and here you have the different dates. For example, here 21st of June, this is winter in most part of Brazil. So here um, uh, you have the different dates. Uh, so you, here you have uh, it uh, goes down at 5 p.m. and goes up at uh, 6 a.m. and uh, that's the uh, equivalent for Rio de Janeiro. If you see uh, because it's directly uh, at 25 degrees. Uh, 25.5 degrees south of the equator, uh, you have perpendicular irradiance at the 21st of December. You can calculate this, uh, this slide used for my students. I think we will publish the slides also later. So if you make an app or something like this, you can also make this kind of graph. These are the formulas for that, just you have to uh, uh, use them. I don't go to the details of it. Here, even uh, you can consider uh, the reflection of the air because uh, the reflection of the air uh, does some distortion, and uh, this is also considered here. So this is from the Astronomical Almanac, so you can very accurately calculate the position of the sun or the apparent position of the sun you have, which is relevant for your solar energy conversion. Uh, we talk only about direct irradiance. Uh, you don't have only direct because a lot of it is scattered or, or absorbed in the atmosphere. Uh, so uh, we have a large part in, in sunny areas. Uh, we have 30% of our participation of diffuse irradiance. In Germany in winter we uh, often have 100% diffuse irradiance. You don't see this that directly. Um, and also we have a, another component which is called albedo. This is a reflected irradiance. So if you have a, a, a very uh, reflecting ground, like snow or glacier or white sand, uh, it can make us, depending on the position of that, of the receiver surface, of what the inclination angle is, it can make uh, also a significant impact on the global irradiance there. Uh, 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 and for photovoltaics, uh, if you don't have any concentrators and so on, uh, this global irradiance is relevant, which consists of direct, diffuse and albedo irradiance. All of them are uh, relevant. Um, especially now, uh, we'll come to this later at the very end of the lecture, uh, when we talk about bifacial solar cells. 
Uh, they can uh, profit a lot from uh, albedo, so it's quite good to know this has been ignored for uh, two decades, but now this albedo becomes more important uh, because if you can receive also the radiance from the back, uh, this can have uh, increased the energy yield by 10 or 20 percent. So this is just a first estimate, so if you see a heavy clouds, it's about 50 to 200 meter per uh, watt per square meter in the radiance level. If you have 200 to uh, 700, we have maybe have some clouds. If you have clear sky, it's mostly between 700 and 1,000 watt per square meter. So without just looking in the sky, you can quickly guess. Actually, we do it more accurately. We have a pyranometer to measure that. I come to this a bit later. Also, I think tomorrow Mr. Sillis will show you pyranometers and measurement stations and so on. This is a plot here where you have the a share uh, of a diffuse and direct irradiance in Cairo. Um, so you see it here, uh, there is uh, even in Cairo, which is usually the desert there, and then you have a, uh, oh, this is closed into a big city, but there is even a, a high share of diffuse irradiance. And in Germany, sometimes you have only diffuse irradiance. So um, here's it. what I said, uh, it's most important is the global irradiance, uh, and this you see for different locations on the planet over the year. So we start in January here, uh, to the Sahara Desert, it's winter there, and the radiance is at about uh, 5 kilowatt hours per square meter per day. So it's daily radiance. So if you have uh, like a half of this table here, put the sun, and uh, it receives 5 kilowatt hours. So if you would convert it by efficiency of 10% of the photovoltaics, you would have half a kilowatt hour. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it goes up to 8 kilowatt hours per square meter per uh, 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 day. Uh, and uh, here, if you go to London, or it's very close to Germany, you would have this one. So winter is really bad there. So it's below one, only half. Uh, really, so about a factor of five less. Uh, summer is not so bad. So the difference uh, is not even a factor of two. And this both problem, for example, if you have locations like this, London, if you want to have a a full provision of uh, s solar energy during the whole year because you have to cope with that. Here, yeah, summer doesn't any, pose any problems, uh, but uh, the winter is a real problem. And if you make, want to make autonomous systems which won't have to work without grid connection through the whole year, you have to think about uh, enormous energy storage capacities. Uh, I'll give you an example later uh, how to calculate that, but uh, this nowadays is the most expensive part uh, because storage is getting somehow cheaper, but uh, solar cells got much uh, uh, cheaper at a much quicker rate. And I'll give you some examples later for some, some uh, autonomous systems. Uh, this is for Brazil now compared to Germany, uh, Hamburg. Uh, here, let's see here now summer, so it's not so bad now in summer. So it's even better than Rio de Janeiro at the moment, uh, uh, the radiance. But the problem is also winter, similar to London, here below one kilowatt hour per square meter per year. Uh, and here, um, um, Rio de Janeiro is more than six times more uh, of the radiance. So uh, here, the minimum is here nowadays, at a rate of about four kilowatt hour per square meter. So if you calculate with a, uh, uh, four kilowatt hour per square meter, you can supply energy for the whole year and have a surplus in summary in, in Rio de Janeiro. Sorry, Sao Paulo is not here. Uh, we have some other, uh, Porto Alegre is here. So Sao Paulo is somewhere between Rio and Porto Alegre. Uh, and Porto Alegre, so this is just here for Porto Alegre, you have a quite a low minimum, 3.2 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Any question? No. The name of Kuipa. 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 Uh, if you have any questions, uh, yes, uh, please. Are there any questions? Yes, please.
and uh, then uh, you have uh, here a, a steam turbine at the end, and then you can create electricity at a rate of 10 cents per kilowatt hour. This was cheap during that time because photovoltaic at that time costed about 10 times more, one euro per kilowatt hour. Nowadays, photovoltaic really got cheaper than that. So this is the power flow, so the nice one is due to hibernate, what's the reflection, and the, the absorption, and so on. The thermal losses we have here, convective heat transfer, radiation, and so on. You uh, can also concentrate uh, by uh, Binel uh, lenses, for example, is also possible. You don't have to have a parabolic mirror for, for doing that. Uh, now we come to uh, see, uh, take a look at the empty fluxes. So we just discussed about a lot about incoming radiance, uh, whether it's concentrated or not, about the reflection a little bit. Uh, and uh, then uh, if you have a transparent uh, uh, receiver, uh, some of it uh, gets, uh, some of the radiance passes it. And then uh, for solar thermal application, this is a main destiny here, that you want to convert it into heat energy or heat flow. We have photovoltaics, we're going to have a, a, a large part being converted into electrical energy. So this is, for example, the energy flow inside of that plate collector. Uh, very simple ones, you can purchase here everywhere. Uh, you have here uh, the 100% of incoming radiance, and you have the cover glass. Uh, according to the refractive index of conventional glass, which is 1.54, and the air is 1.0, uh, you have a reflection of about 4% here for the uh, first interface. If you go to the second interface, again 4%. So you lose the about 8% of the radiance uh, due to reflection. This depends also on the incoming angle, I come to this a bit later. Also, uh, if you don't buy a very expensive quartz glass here, you have some absorption here of in the vicinity of 2%. And uh, then you have the absorber, which is not perfect, so you lose uh, some reflection also on the absorber. Uh, then you have, of this, this is now converted into heat. And this heat is also not perfectly transmitted, you have some natural convection because uh, to the uh, heat, uh, hot absorber, uh, uh, air is getting hot, and it uh, gets a buoyancy because uh, the density is lighter, it goes up here, and you lose about 13% of that. Uh, also, you have some thermal radiation of the absorber plate. Usually, there's much more, but while we have a cover glass here, uh, this is a kind of artificial greenhouse effect here, uh, then we have only 6% of losses. But then if it would be open, this would be much higher. Uh, also, uh, you have some thermal conduction depending on the quality of your uh, uh, system. Uh, here, for example, typically up 3% of losses. And the end, you have about 60% uh, of the 100% which comes in. Which is not so bad if you compare it to photovoltaics formerly. It was only 10%, now it's 20%. This depends very much on the temperature and the model. I could do this a bit. Uh, uh, so you see here, uh, for example, for a standard collector here, uh, first you have the optical losses, which are in the vicinity of 8%, uh, plus the uh, uh, reflection on the absorber. And uh, here are the thermal losses. Uh, the optical losses are not temperature dependent. So it's independent from the absorber temperature, always the same amount of losses in the vicinity of uh, 8% plus 4%, so 12% uh, uh, losses here. This is not more 12, 14% of losses, optical losses here. Uh, and here you have the term losses, uh, which depend on temperature. The higher the temperature is, the higher the losses are. Uh, here, for example, at standard test conditions, which means we have an irradiance of 1000 watt per square meter, uh, you see you can achieve a high temperature difference. But what happens in winter? When you, uh, your uh, heat is most needed. For example, here 200 watt per square meter. So you only achieve a temperature difference of 40 degrees only. And this only if you pump the water in a very, very slow rate through the collector. Uh, this means you have a very uh, low uh, efficiency here because uh, you don't pump, pump a lot of water. The highest efficiency if you have almost no temperature difference. So you pump at a very high rate. So uh, the losses are low, but uh, you, you cannot profit a lot because the temperature difference you create is very low. But the nominal efficiency is quite high. 
if you go to different technologies uh, of these collectors, uh, you see that uh, differ significantly. First, let's talk about a carbon absorber. You just have a, a, a plastic tube to put it into the sun. Nothing else. No cover, uh, no glass cover, nothing. You see here, uh, for very low um, temperature difference, the efficiency is even better than all the others. Can you imagine why? Yes, it's all light is absorbed. There is no reflection by the glass sheet because we have optical losses which do not occur here. Therefore, this is uh, that's a good, very good efficiency, uh, 95% or so. Uh, and uh, this is very good if you have, uh, for example, if you need a very low temperature difference. For example, swimming pools in summer or something. You only need to increase temperature maybe by 5 degrees or people are happy. So this is uh, quite good for that. You don't have to buy an expensive uh, vacuum tube collector or something like this. This is sufficient for that. So it really depends on the application, which collector you should use. If you need a high temperature difference, and especially in also winter, for example, for heating purposes, uh, then you should switch to a different technology, for example, here to a flat plate collector. So we have here, uh, uh, first, uh, here, this dark line is the flat plate collector with one cover, glass only, non-selective. I'll explain this, selective and non-selective a bit later. Uh, that we have with two glass is already significantly better, but you see already here the difference here. Because you have two glasses, you have double the reflections. And so here, for small temperature difference, the efficiency is not really good. But if you have high temperature difference, for example, you want to create a temperature difference of 100 degrees, it's not possible with the one glass uh, uh, collector. You have to have a two glass collector. And here, the uh, uh, efficiency is not so good, but not so well. Uh, and the best is here, if you have a vacuum tube collector, then you have can create a temperature difference of above 200 degrees. Why is it so good, vacuum? Which of the losses are you avoiding to use? What, which of the losses are uh, eliminated? Natural convection. Yes, here, yeah, natural convection is, we don't have any more. Uh, thermal radiation you still have. It's a bit reduced if you have a second cover glass and so on. Now come to the selective and non-selective. Uh, for this, I go back to the spectrum level. So we have here the wavelength of the irradiance in a logarithmic scale here. And uh, here again, uh, we have the black body radiation of the sun here. So it looks quite symmetrical in a logarithmic scale here. And uh, here, uh, we have a non-selective absorber. Uh, which is uh, just black body, uh, which absorbs, so it absorbs uh, all uh, wavelengths at the same rate. And there is a law called uh, that uh, the emission of uh, so for black body emission is equal to the absorption. Alpha is epsilon, so that means uh, if you have a high absorption, you have a high emission also. That means we have the advantage here that area. This is very welcome. Uh, we absorb all the sunlight and convert it into heat. On that part, uh, here at about 10 micrometers, or 10,000 uh, nanometers, this is about the thermal radiation of your solar collector. If you have a solar collector which is 100 degrees Celsius warm, it creates infrared radiation. You can measure that. You can have an infrared thermometer using that. This is, works in the vicinity of 10 micrometers. So the idea was uh, you want to have high absorption here, but low emission here in that part, so you want to avoid thermal emission here. And this you can do via so-called a selective absorber. The property is that uh, it's black in the visible range, or the, the range of the solar, solar radiance, but in the infrared range, it gets, gets white, and also it doesn't absorb, neither emits uh, thermal radiation. And this is so called uh, to, uh, the uh, a selective absorber. Uh, you cannot see really uh, if, if you you can see visibly because uh, our human eye is limited to that, so both appear black to you. Uh, but if you measure it at the infrared range, you can really see the difference, and, and you see here this huge differences here. Uh, here, uh, uh, selective and non-selective. So here, uh, 
you can achieve much higher temperatures here. And also, at the same temperature, you can achieve much higher conversion efficiency. It's not as perfect, perhaps, uh, here. The absorption rate uh, is not so good. You have a bit more reflection, uh, uh, because you can get it really a selective absorber, as same as good as 100% or a black body absorber. Uh, but at the end, uh, if you have uh, here, for example, temperature difference of 75 degrees, here you get only 10% of conversion efficiency, and here uh, you get almost 40% of conversion efficiency. Uh, almost four, four times more. Okay. So, uh, come now to the systems. We talked about the connectors now, and the, the, uh, now we come to the systems. A uh, very simple system, which is very often used in Brazil, is the so-called thermosiphon principle. Uh, so you have here uh, hot water st uh, storage with water, that comes cold water in. The cold water goes to the collector, it's getting heated up in the collector. And uh, warm water is lighter than uh, cold water, so it automatically flows up here. Uh, to a certain rate, so the height limit is the height difference is quite limited, it's only about half a meter or so, if, uh, good for more. And uh, then you store it in a higher position of the storage, so you have some stratification in the water, if you don't mix it up so much, you have here the cold water and the hot water up, up. if you take away the hot water here. And uh, that's a very common principle, you find it in the Mediterranean, uh, uh, not uh, uh, here. Uh, in Cyprus or in, uh, uh, in Israel or in, uh, in southern Italy. Uh, so this is quite commonly used. Um, Turkey is also quite, uh, so this is a system from Turkey, for example, and here it costs, uh, also Brazil, uh, it's quite, it costs about 800 euro, something like depending on the quality of the manufacturer, whether it's stainless steel or whatever. So this is a typical system. They look all pretty much the same. Uh, here, uh, here is more, uh, this is in Portugal here. Uh, this is even Australia, solar heart. So this is the system. Uh, while the buoyancy of the uh, heated water is very low, but the always storage has to be very close to the collector. This led to a system in Brazil to typically integrate here, so you integrate uh, the, the storage almost inside the collector. Uh, this is not possible in many countries because it's freezing in winter. And uh, if you want to freeze it, you cannot use the water you're using for showering. Uh, you can use it directly. You can have to have different media rather than water. For example, coal, something like this. Uh, and uh, if you have coal and uh, you want to have a heat of water, uh, you have to have a heat exchanger. And this heat exchanger needs some pressure, and that's not possible anymore via the buoyancy of the water. So you have to add a pump in order to get it working, to get it running, you have to pump. If you have a pump, you have to have a control also. Because in winter, in nighttime, uh, you don't want the system to work, otherwise it's more cooling than heating. So you have just, you have to, this is, uh, uh, system uh, is, uh, the control is related to the temperature, uh, so it really detects whether there is some positive uh, temperature gradient between them. So it's only cooling down, you won't let the system work only if the contribution by the collector is positive, uh, the control starts a pump. And then you have here the, the coal uh, media here, and then you have a heat exchanger, and then you have, uh, same as in Brazil, the hot water storage, and you take away the hot water here. Sometimes, uh, if you are really winter, you have an additional power uh, supply. Even in Brazil, some people use an electric additional supply to overcome some uh, uh, very bad periods. So there's a, a software, for example, here the, the, the TSOL. This was uh, my colleague at the Technical University of Berlin. This was his PhD thesis, and he made a lifetime living out of it by making that software. I uh, don't know whether he can, we can, can start to break it. Uh, I can see the video. No? Is there a way we can we can switch on the video? No, oh, no, no, it's, uh, it's totally sorry. No, no, the video doesn't start. Okay, but it's uh, you can also download it here from the uh, manufacturer. It explains the software. Perhaps you can find some time. Uh, 
we'll get it started here. Just so someone know over here? Yeah. Just click on the on the middle of the go on the middle on the middle. Yeah, somewhere yes, just on the slide yes. No, no, it was okay, but was okay. Because uh, it started. Yeah, just like this. So this is just the. Yeah, it it already runs, I think. No, no. Ah, the sound is not working. Okay, but uh, we skip that and uh, we go continue. We have enough slides for that. So. Ah, here, it shows some uh, uh, the software here. You have people figure layouts, uh, and uh, so you can decide whether you have uh, here uh, one storage, two storages, uh, different loads, and so on. And uh, uh, Location is determined. Uh, so here you have also some, some buffer system sometimes. So you have tanks at two different temperature. You can give in the position here uh, uh, where you are, and then uh, it uh, calculates uh, local irradiance and the output. Uh, we have a, a large data bank of different collector manufacturers, um, and uh, you can also use it for sizing the area. So you uh, have your requirements, and at the end, uh, the program is giving you how many. Um, how many collectors you have to purchase. And uh, this is a fraction. Uh, so while in Germany, as I told you, winter is very difficult to so never achieve 100% or you have a really large storage or large scale uh, uh, power plant. So you only uh, achieve here, for example, 33% of this. Uh, it's even a, a photorealistic uh, option here uh, so you can uh, with your wife, for example, sometimes they don't like solar collectors and so on, and so you can show uh, how it will look like on your finished house, the collectors, and uh, uh, it uh, uh, gives you uh, an idea of that, uh, how, how it will look like. Is this finished now? No, wait a minute. Is this... Is this no, it comes to something. Uh, so also yield forecast, so you have a, a minute step uh, simulation, operation conditions. Uh, and uh, so we have here the solar fraction for space heating and uh, domestic hot water supply, tank systems, and so on. And this. So here you can have modify that uh, depending on the cost you want to relate to that, and then the system you have, and then kind of uh, um, location also plays a role. We also have a profitability calculation. So how much money you invest, what's your interest rate, uh, and uh, uh, how much money you can save or not. Okay, you can uh, also download some trial version. I think it works for, uh, yes? Uh, you can adjust this uh, part for solar energy, thermal solar energy, because the professor for that you Actually, okay, okay, okay. Actually, okay. Actually, okay. 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 Another slide that you show yes. the concentrated basis. No. Uh, 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 this, 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 this one. Yes. This, yes. Because uh, that this type of system uh, increase the temperature and the uh, when you increase the temperature, the the, the efficiency of photovoltaic cells uh, decrease. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm coming to when you talk about photovoltaics. Yes, yes, yes. But just this is what about concentration of irradiance. This is not not yet. Not not for photovoltaics. Yeah, I think it's always concentrator. It just works for direct irradiance. 
So either Fraser lenses or if you have a mirror concentrator, it works for um, uh, concentration only. Uh, and therefore you cannot profit from the difference irradiance. And also you have to have a tracking system, so it's also costly. So at the moment it's not very much used anymore. You have to have maintenance, you have to have high investments costs, and you cannot profit from direct uh, diffuse irradiance. So at the moment the probability of those is a bit questionable. This was about also 20 years ago, so there was a lot of, also because the solar cells have been much more expensive. Nowadays you just buy more solar cells and don't care about uh, efficiency and so on. Can do both, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was my PhD thesis on 1993, exactly on combination of uh, uh, solar thermal and solar. But I come to this later when I come to photovoltaics. Okay. So this was the last slide on uh, uh, solar thermal. So this is software for it. And this just is a working of this, so we hear much more on this tomorrow. So this is also so a kind of solar thermal which works with hot air, uh, just to cover uh, area of land, and then the hot air is driving a kind of wind turbine here to create uh, also power. So this is definitely the last slide here of solar thermal. So now we come uh, to uh, 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 the direct conversion of sunlight into electricity. But most of it is uh, used for. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, you can spend hours uh, talking that I try to do it in five seconds, uh, how photovoltaic works. So, uh, so here you see uh, the uh, working, how does a solar cell work. Um, the most important thing is here you have an electrical field inside a uh, silicon crystal. You can create it by doping here, uh, like an end layer and a P layer, I explained in five minutes. Uh, and uh, then you have absorption of sunlight. And uh, during the absorption process, uh, you excitate uh, one electron volt pair. And if the electrical field is strong enough, it can transport away the electron and it can create an electrical current. Uh, not only through the solar cell, but if you have a closed circuit here, uh, you can supply some load uh, here. And uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, energy you get there is, depends on the amount of photons being absorbed and uh, whether the excitation was uh, enough for really to be transported. This we'll discuss now in a bit more detail. So, uh, this is also a video of bricks. I know there's a lot of talk, so I jump over that and explain it manually. Whatever, does it start? It's a video too. It's also a video. Okay. Uh, this, uh, I think there's a lot of talk, and I don't know what this guy. Yes, you just uh, or on the. You cannot start it from here. Okay, all they do is guys talking a lot. Uh, so. Uh, wait a minute, if you can. No, without, without the. the it's better to jump over and I explain it here because uh, this is even uh, quite small. Uh, so, we're just explaining the processing of silicon, uh, quartzite into metallurgical silicon. Here, 
And this is a traditional way, the so-called Schuhalski process. It's not the most energy efficient, but the most traditional process. Historically, most of solar cells have been made like this. So you have a crystal seed, and you put it in the silicon belt, and you take it out very, very slowly. And then, uh, uh, if you do it slowly enough, uh, then all the other atoms adjust themselves in a crystalline form to the uh, uh, seed crystals. And then you have a monocrystalline ingot, it's called. It's like a very big sausage here, uh, which is uh, up to 1 meter 50 or even 2 meters. It has a diameter of 10 to 15 centimeters, and yet you slice that sausage uh, slices. Uh, usually for electronic industry, it's called wafers. For solar, you use it uh, uh, still. Uh, and uh, formerly, uh, this wafer thickness has been uh, about uh, half a millimeter. Nowadays, you have a better source so called multi wire slurry a source, uh, which allow a soil losses in the vicinity of only 0 0.1 millimeters. Uh, and also, you can make much thinner wafer thicknesses. This avoids a lot of material losses here, and therefore, this is also the main reason why solar cells got much cheaper, because you need much less material and also much energy to produce it. Uh, this is a Schuhalski process, uh, uh, also a, a more energy efficient, so called multi crystalline uh, silicon. Uh, so you put it into a tile, and uh, then uh, the silicon crystallizes by itself, so you don't, you don't have a seed. This is not running perfectly. There are some areas which is a single crystal, but other areas no, it changes direction. So you have, it looks like granite here, so you have here some areas uh, which are uh, a perfect uh, monocrystalline, but then it changes. And uh, the main idea uh, was uh, to insulate these different uh, areas uh, to each other, that there is no current uh, interference between them. And uh, this was achieved in the last years. And therefore, these kind of so-called multi-crystalline solar cells almost have the same efficiency as the mono or single crystalline solar cells. They are even more cheaper to produce. Uh, and uh, as a second step, uh, so this is now uh, just uh, silicon, just work yet. We don't have the electrical field inside yet. So what we do, uh, first uh, doping usually takes place already in the silicon. We put, for example, some boron atoms inside the silicon melt. Uh, and uh, here, for example, uh, we uh, dope one other side uh, by a phosphorus. So there is some phosphorus atoms coming in. Uh, and here, for example, here you have a phosphorus atom. So this is the original silicon. And then you have the so-called endoped silicon, a phosphorus atom. Uh, here, uh, for the silicon, uh, to say uh, that has, has four outer electrons. And these four outer electrons combine perfectly in a tetrahedral form with its neighbors. So all uh, outer electrons form a, a link uh, between the other neighborings, uh, neighbors here. And here, the phosphorus atom, uh, it also starts well here. It has all four outer electrons, but there is a fifth electron, uh, which doesn't find a partner here. So this is electron is free, it's easily movable. So this is uh, an electron is negative, so this is easily movable, and therefore it's called in silicon. Uh, this is done here, in this process here. Uh, so we, we have uh, here some uh, substance cont uh, containing phosphorus here. Oh, no, okay. On the other side, uh, we have here, as I told you already, uh, in, in the beginning sometime, you uh, pour in some uh, boron. Boron has only three outer electrons, and uh, to keep a co perfect combination with the neighbor, uh, you need uh, theoretically another electron which is not existent. What are you doing if you miss something? You ask a neighbor. So you take this electron from the neighbor, uh, and this continues like this. So it's like a virtual a missing electron, or if you go missing electron or negative electron, it's a positive charge. So this is like a moving positive charge, and therefore it's called p silicon. If you have uh, two of those areas together in one <coughs> crystal, uh, what happens? There's some diffusion here, for example, because this is easy movable, and there is a lack of concentration of uh, electrons here. Some of these electrons move over here. Uh, and now the following happens. Before that, there were five electrons, but also five protons here. 
So it was electrically neutral. It's called in silicon, but it's electrically neutral. But now these electrons move over here. What happens now? We have uh, more electrons than protons here, and it gets charged negative. So we have negative charge here. This is vice versa, to a bit slower, a less, a lesser rate. And then uh, we have uh, negative charge here, positive charge here, and it creates an electrical field. That's what we want. This is essential for the photovoltaic effect. So we create an internal electrical field. It's the same as a diode. If you have some semiconductor glass or something like this, this is just uh, how a diet is created. And now, if uh, here we have the absorption of a, of a photon, uh, then it, uh, uh, it, uh, it excitates a silicon atom, so an uh, electron is free for a short time. It gets transported along that electrical field which we created there. You have to apply the contacts here, for example, here, a uh, uh, front contact. Uh, you cannot make it massively uh, because you want to, there's still some irradiance coming in. The back side, you can make a massive contact if you don't have a B phase module. And uh, yeah, that's a solar cell. This is the characteristics of a solar cell. So you have here first a uh, source, a current source, which is triggered by uh, the sun, so the photons. You have a photocurrent, and then you have your diode, which is uh, a parallel uh, to that source. So uh, for each voltage, which is above uh, the breakthrough voltage of the diode, uh, it's getting short circuit. Then you have some resistors. This is a, 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 a series resistor uh, of the grid uh, uh, due to the context. And this is a parallel resistor, uh, which is due to impurity in the crystal. And this is our load here. And this is so-called ID curve here of the crystal. So it's negative uh, uh, currents. Uh, it should be used for the, because, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the diodes uh, here. And so we do have here uh, up to a voltage of 0 0.6 volts. You have a current. If the current is, uh, the voltage is getting higher, it's getting short circuit here by the diode here. So this is an uh, area where you can operate in. Uh, the, 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 uh, and uh, this uh, is the impact of uh, that parallel resistor here. So if it's, it, it's uh, infinite, so if it doesn't exist here, so we have a nice uh, line here. So this is, uh, if you multiply uh, voltage by current, so you have here significant uh, power output. If this is getting uh, lower here, for example here 100 ohms, then uh, the voltage almost stays the same, but the current is reduced because we have some <coughs> current losses inside here. Uh, and then the power output is also reduced. So this shows how it, uh, this impacts on the power output. Here we have the same, but for the series resistance, which is related to the contacts. If we have massive contacts, then the series resistance is almost zero, so we would have a curve like this one. If we have high series resistance, we lose a voltage here, because there's a voltage loss over that resistor. And this reduces our power output. Why it's a bit boring just to calculate with negative currents uh, here, we switch it, we flip it uh, over here, and we take that curve. So here we have the current, and uh, here uh, we have also the voltage here, uh, here short circuit uh, current, and then uh, we increase the uh, load uh, resistor, and then we come to a point where the product uh, multiplication of voltage times current is maximum. This is the so-called maximum power point. This is where, where we want to uh, operate the solar cell. You see it here at the red curve, the power curve. So here we have the maximum current, but voltage is zero, so power is zero also. Here we have a voltage of 0 0.1 volts and a current of about 1 amps. So as you see here, our power output here is about 0 0.1 watts. So the current stays almost the same, so we increase about some 0 0.4 volts. One amp, so we have about 0 0.4 uh, watts, and that is about the maximum uh, you can get because now uh, the current stays the same, but uh, I don't know the the, the voltage, uh, the current is uh, sinking rapidly, and uh, then uh, the power goes down in a, in a rapid pace. We have one parameter which we will call uh, form factor. Uh, this is. Uh, 
the multiplication of the uh, voltage the maximum power point times the current of maximum power point divided by the theoretical maximum, the open circuit voltage, and uh, the short circuit current. So this would form uh, a rectangular form like this one, which is never achievable, but what would be the ideal. And the softer uh, that curve is, the lower is the form factor. The more rectangular it is, the more closer it is to one. This is uh, the current supplied to the load. So this is the typically diet formula uh, which we have. So here we have the photo current. Uh, we have the diet uh, formula here, and uh, the resulting uh, current supplied to the load. This is open circuit voltage, uh, which is. Oh, sorry, I forgot to piece a little bit. Uh, current 
is directly proportional to the irradiance. So 10% uh, of the irradiance means you have 10% of the short circuit current. Uh, here we have uh, something special. Usually we should expect the voltage stays the same, but actually that's not the case. Why? Uh, this is due to the, uh, we have the equivalent circuit here. Go back to the equivalent circuit. Uh, while we at low irradiance level, uh, what we have to do to keep the module working in the maximum power point if we have low irradiance level? Do we have to increase or decrease that, uh, uh, that uh, load resistance? Increase your resistance value? Increasing? Your resistance value? Yes, uh, this is a load resistance. And now we go from high irradiance levels to low irradiance levels. What happens? The load reduced as the current. Yeah, the current is reduced. Voltage stays about the same. That means low current, high voltage is increased. increasing the load. Exactly, we have to increase the uh, load resistor in order to keep it working in the maximum power point. This is a foreign impact. This is all inside the solar cell, we cannot change it. So this also stays the same. And then the distribution is a bit different because now is high resistance here, this resistance stays the same. So there is a higher share being lost inside the solar cells due to this parasitic uh, uh, parallel resistor, which is due to the impurities in the solar cell. So we lose more here relatively. And this you can see here on this curve, here, on that curve that you see here, uh, for our low irradiance levels here, uh, we have some losses here, and the maximum power point is also bit shifted. So besides having uh, uh, low power output due to the irradiance level, we also have a reduction in efficiency, unfortunately. So this is uh, uh, provides a lower efficiency than uh, for uh, an originally given. This is called the uh, weak light effect. I discuss and show it afterwards with what's the effect of it. Another effect uh, is temperature. Uh, temperature, as you saw in the formula before, uh, we, uh, is, uh, is temperature dependent. And uh, here you see if we uh, uh, increase the temperature, uh, here, here uh, the dashed line is the standard test conditions here, 25 degrees. If we increase temperature, voltage is going down. Uh, the current is a little bit increased because the solar cell gets more sensible in the infrared region. So we increased uh, current a little bit, but in general uh, we reduce voltage and also power output. So this uh, depends on the solar cell technologies, so in the vicinity of 0.5% per, per Kelvin of increase. We have a, here we have a, a table here which shows the different technology at the reduction of power output, for example, for multi-crystal and silicon, which is the most often used nowadays, uh, you have a reduction of minus 0.44% uh, per Kelvin. Uh, for current, it's even a bit decreasing. And uh, here, the coefficient is also temperature dependent. So the, uh, the uh, form factor is also temperature dependent. And also, uh, it, the, the decreases a little bit with temperature. Uh, there was one table I just want to mention here as NOCT is called nominal operating standard test uh, uh, conditions, which is not equivalent to the standard test conditions, but it would be more appropriate uh, to that because uh, it would not consider only cell temperature, it would consider the uh, actual ambient temperature and uh, then the actual operating temperature which develops depending on the cell technology and so on. Uh, and also consider the wind speed and uh, global irradiance level, which is not that bright, such as a bit reduced, 800 watt per square meter, and also elevation of the module. The output, uh, according to the NOS uh, uh, nominal operating uh, uh, conditions or the nominal operating uh, temperature, uh, is here you see the temperature much elevated than the 25 degrees we have at standard test conditions. Uh, this is uh, uh, much higher and therefore power output is lower also due to the uh, lower radius level and uh, while it's lower the industry didn't accept it because they want to have uh, high numbers and show off a lot but this would be more realistic for science uh, community this would be more relevant 
But unfortunately, the standard test conditions are now uh, the most dominant uh, you use uh, uh, for that. Uh, but this is more realistic. So from uh, uh, this uh, NOCT, just keep in mind that some of the can you find those conditions. Uh, here for NOCT, there's a norm for that, how to measure it. Uh, if you can achieve uh, the uh, ambient temperature, there's a compensation chart for it. Uh, also, you can uh, have the, the quick uh, overview about the temperature you can achieve. Uh, so you saw this 45 degrees for many models. Uh, but if you, for example, have a rack mount, uh, uh, for example, for free mount insulation, you can even a lower temperature by 3 degrees. If you directly mount on the uh, surface of a roof uh, without any ventilation, uh, you have an increased temperature by 80 degrees. Uh, if you have uh, uh, some, some uh, air gap in between, uh, then the air can fluctuate. And uh, here you see, as bigger the air gap is, the lower is the operation temperature. So uh, we are almost at the end of the session. Like, huh? It's, it's, it, uh, you need to finish. Okay, yeah, so we go to the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we have more uh, <laughs> to to You need to return uh, some uh, minutes uh, after. Well, uh, so we can turn uh, and go back to the schedule. Yeah. 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 Yeah.